Good afternoon, everyone, on this rainy day in Washington, D.C. I'm Jenny LeRae, Vice President for Strategy and Communications at Research America, and welcome to our Alliance member webinar with Dr. Peter Hotez. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, please type your questions into the question box at any time. We'll save questions for the end for our moderator to read. And for those of you dialing in by phone, we'll open up the lines after Dr. Hotez's presentation and you can simply hit star six to unmute your line and ask a question. Our speaker today is Dr. Peter Hotez, renowned infectious disease expert and physician scientist um, with many positions and accomplishments, um, but suffice to say he is the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, and he co-directs the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. Peter, it is so terrific for you to join us. Thank you for extending your time with us to a full hour. We know how busy you are, not only with your own research, which we'll hear about shortly, but the terrific media you've been doing um, day in and day out to provide such clear uh, and compelling information to the public. I am now gonna hand the screen over to you. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. It's a real honor to do anything to be linked to Research America. I can't think of a more important organization in Washington, DC, except maybe the NIH. And uh, you've done such uh, path-breaking work and advocacy, and you guys are my role model for how to do advocacy ar around science. Uh, which of course is more important than ever. You know, I think one of the, if there's any silver lining to this uh, COVID-19 uh, disaster, and it really is a disaster, is the fact that I think people are now hearing from scientists at an unprecedented level uh, compared to the past and, and, and hearing from scientists unfiltered. And I think that's going to be really important for us because one of the things that I've spoken about at Research America over the years is the fact that scientists too often are invisible, that, that the American public doesn't have a good sense of what scientists does. And that has had an enabling effect uh, for anti-science movements like the anti-vaccine movement that, that I've uh, had to go up against uh, over the years. And, and so today what I'm going to do is uh, talk about uh, kind of a 30,000 foot aerial view of where I see uh, global health going. And since that's one of my passions, I developed vaccines for neglected tropical diseases. And then uh, about 10 years ago, we added to that portfolio a coronavirus uh, vaccine program. But I didn't want to only talk about our coronavirus vaccine program. I wanted to put it in, in, this, in this context uh, of, a, of a larger, bigger picture. And uh, the other thing I like to do is uh, I like to write books. Uh, the last one was called That Research America was really helpful in making people aware of what's called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism about, uh, about my daughter Rachel and why vaccines don't cause autism. But this is the title of the next book, which uh, will be uh, published by Johns Hopkins University Press again that'll come out at the end of either this year, probably the beginning of next year, uh, that's very relevant to our current situation. It's called Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. Um, so Jenny, are you doing the slides or is somebody doing the slides? Uh, I'll just say, go to the next slide, please. I guess we'll do it that way. And, uh, and it starts out with a, a good news part of the story, which is that uh, vaccines have been incredibly successful. Uh, what happened was in the year 2000, the Millennium Development Goals were launched. And uh, with that, that, that actually more or less signaled the start of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And one of the big tranches of money that the Gates Foundation provided was to start the organization you see at the bottom there, the old logo and the new logo, which is the Gavi Alliance. Now we just call it Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, originally stood for the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. And I, I think it's one of the most successful global health programs uh, ever launched. And uh, that the idea was to expand the use of existing vaccines 
uh, like the vaccines for measles, pertussis, tetanus, haemophilus, influenza, and diphtheria, while simultaneously introducing two new vaccines for pneumococcal disease and, uh, and rotavirus infection. And this, uh, by all measures, has been an extraordinarily, extraordinarily successful undertaking. Here are some, we've all heard about the IHME models. The other thing IHME has been doing is monitoring progress for some of these big global health problems. And you can see that it's resulted in big dramatic reductions in the number of kids dying every year from measles, from half a million kids dying to under 100,000. Similar gains in pertussis and tetanus and homophilus influenza type B and diphtheria. And on the right hand slide, I just show some pictures from my favorite uh, black and white uh, photographer, uh, Sebastio Salgado, does, does these amazing images of people being photographed uh, of getting their vaccines. He did this for a, a commemorative uh, uh, exhibit for the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization. Next slide. Uh, my own experience, my own personal experience goes something like this. Um, uh, back in the 1980s, I was a pediatric house officer at Mass General, and I was admitting a child every few weeks with haemophilus influenza type B meningitis, hid meningitis. And um, at that time, the house officers were required, the residents were required to do the lumbar punctures and look at the cerebral spinal fluid under the microscope. And when you did that, this is what you would see, polymorphonuclear leukocytes and gram-negative organisms in your heart sank as you knew there was a high likelihood that that child was gonna not do well with hib meningitis. And, and what you can see on the left is the timeline for one new of the, the incidence of hib meningitis and then the timelines of when new vaccines were introduced. And the first two vaccines that were introduced, those first two arrows, were new vaccines, but they, they were not effective at immunizing infants uh, against the infection. Uh, and then the last arrow was when uh, John Robbins and Raquel Schneerson at the NIH uh, and uh, David Smith and Porter Anderson in Rochester and Boston figured out you could modify the vaccine by binding it to protein taking the haemophilus influenza type B capsule, binding it to protein, and then it was effective in immunizing infants. And you could see what happened. The vaccine completely disappeared. So this was a disease that I went admitting kids every couple of weeks with uh, at Mass General to by the time I was a junior faculty member at Yale. It was a disease I pretty much spoke about in terms of his, uh, historic interest only. So it really goes to show you the power of what a vaccine can do. The other thing I liked showing the slides, and I've been talking about it in the context of COVID, you know, you've been hearing about this race for a COVID vaccine. And I, I've been trying to uh, put some perspective on that by saying, you know, there may be a race, but the first vaccine is often not our best vaccine. And, and HIB is a good example. In fact, for most of our vaccines, the first vaccine is not our best vaccine. They get, re they get refined and improved upon so that the, the first set of COVID vaccines that come out, uh, expect them to undergo revisions and improvements in, in, in subsequent years. So that maybe one day we'll be in a situation like homophilus influenza type B uh, meningitis. On the next slide. And the success has continued. This is the uh, consequence of the global elimination of diseases like polio, uh, where through the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, which is through the WHO and UNICEF and Gavi and the Rotarians and Rotary Club and, uh, of course, the Gates Foundation, we've seen this dramatic uh, decrease in uh, going from 125 countries endemic uh, with polio down to two or three. And, and that's been really gratifying to see that. And even for measles, we've seen uh, enormous progress in eliminating measles based on the number I showed you previously. And that's quite an accomplishment given the fact how contagious measles is. And, and by now, anyone watching cable news on a regular basis has heard about the reproductive number, the r naught, refers to the number of people infected if a single individual has the disease. And you can see that the r naught of measles is 
pretty impressive between 12 and 18. And what that means, practically speaking, is if a single individual has measles, 12 to 18 others will get it. So the fact that we can even talk about eliminating measles means that we're vaccinating more than 95% of the world's population. On the next slide. Now that's the good news. And part of the book is, a premise of the new book is to say all of those great global health gains that we've had since 2000, are now, for reasons that we're still trying to understand, are slowing, or in some cases halting, or in some cases even reversing. And but it's not happening globally. It's happening in certain hotspot areas that are kind of highlighted in blue there, and they tend to be in areas where the that I describe in white there, where political instability combines with climate change, urbanization deforestation or, or anti-science movements. And uh, they're particularly true of vaccine preventable diseases as well as uh, this other group of infections that I didn't really introduce because of time constraints called the neglected tropical diseases or NTDs, which are chronic debilitating infections that I've devoted a good part of my life to. And so I, and to make this sort of clearer, and it's still, not an entirely full baked idea. I thought I would go through just a quickly a couple of case studies, go to some of those examples of those circles in blue on the next slide. So one of the areas is the Arabian Peninsula where we've seen uh, a sharp rise in both vaccine preventable diseases as well as neglected diseases. And on the Arabian Peninsula, particularly in countries such as Syria and Iraq uh, and, uh, and Yemen, we've seen a sharp in increase in these diseases. And I got involved in this because during the Obama administration, I served as a US uh, science envoy focusing on uh, and, and providing access to vaccines uh, in, in this part of the world. And the top picture there is of a kid with uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. It's a disease transmitted by sand flies that inoculates a parasite. It's not a killer disease, but it uh, causes ter terrible disfigurement. And we've seen now with the collapse of the health system infra infrastructure on the Arabian Peninsula, hundreds of thousands of cases there. So it's an example of how, how war and political collapse could contribute to it. But the other thing that many fewer people realize is the other thing that's been happening on the Arabian Peninsula is climate change. We've been seeing uh, temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius or more. In fact, there's a celebrated article called Halfway to Boiling to, to make that point. And this is destroying ancient agricultural lands, creating food insecurity and driving people into cities. And some people feel that was even a stimulus for all of the terrible things that have happened on the Arabian Peninsula over the last few years in terms of the ISIS occupation, that it was actually linked to food insecurity and climate change. And then of course we have this Saudi-Iran proxy war going on in Yemen in the middle panel, uh, which is also causing thousands of deaths from cholera, as well as cases of uh, leishmaniasis and the return of vaccine preventable disease. And then through the annual Hajj pilgrimage and, and Umrah, we're starting to see introduction of new diseases. We've heard about now the interruption of that because of COVID-19, but even a few years before, we've seen the introduction of dengue, and now you have Aedes aegypti mosquitoes and dengue on the Arabian Peninsula. Another example is in Venezuela on the right-hand side, where with the Maduro regime, uh, first Chavez and Maduro, there's been a collapse in the financial infrastructure, halting of vaccination programs and the return of measles. And this has been well documented by PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. And we're seeing that uh, play out uh, with the return of measles in Venezuela. And now you, there's the measles map up on the upper right there. And you can see how it literally looks like it's spilling over now into the Amazon rainforest and into across the border in Colombia where it's affecting indigenous populations, including the Wayu uh, on, in, on the Venezuela border with Colombia, as well as the Anamami uh, uh, Indians, which is causing Native American populations, which is causing devastation and decimation of those populations from measles. And now we're starting to hear about it 
from COVID tragically. The other thing that's happening as, as uh, employment is dried up, people are now retreating into areas where there's illegal mining. And uh, these are immunologically naive people who are now seeing malaria for the first time. So we're seeing a sharp increase in uh, malaria among the miners. In fact, there's the, and that's what the middle panel is, one of the so-called malaria mines as they're called, where there's been a 400% increase in malaria. And it goes on, on the next slide, uh, this is what we're seeing in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Jeffrey Gettleman of the New York Times has used this term, the uh, Africa's unwars, to describe the fact that they're not conventional warfare between warring factions as in the past, but really banditry on civilian populations and predation on civilian populations by Boko Haram on the top there and what we're seeing in DR Congo, which again is collapsing health systems and bringing back vaccine uh, preventable diseases and neglected tropical diseases. Now you might say, well, why the heck do I have Texas and the Gulf Coast in the same context? Well, what we're seeing again is not so much war and political collapse, but uh, climate change and urbanization together with anti-science and you know, Texas is in some ways the the home of the uh, anti-vaccine movement in America where, where we work. And we're seeing a sharp increase in uh, both vaccine preventable diseases as well as neglected diseases like Chagas disease and typhus, uh, dengue and, and many others. So this kind of, this confluence of uh, social determinants and climate change is not unique to what we ordinarily think of low and middle income countries, but even places like Texas. And if you go to the next slide, and uh, along with that has been this uh, shift in uh, poverty related diseases globally. And it's a phenomenon that we're still trying to get our arms around. I've written about this in a book a couple of years back called Blue Marble Health. And it has the following premise, and that is when you add up where all the poverty-related neglected diseases are, uh, which would include AIDS, malaria, TB, but also the neglected tropical diseases, they're not only found in the most devastated countries of places like Central African Republic or South Sudan or DR Congo. On a numbers basis, they're surprisingly common among the G20 economies, the, the group of 20 economies representing the most common, uh, the most, uh, the, the leading economies of the world, as well as Nigeria, which is not a G20 country, but it has a GDP greater than the bottom three or four G20 countries. So that it's, even though the G20 economies account for 86 to 90% of the global economy, it's the poor living among the wealthy that are increasingly accounting for these uh, diseases. And so it tries to make the case, and it's an idea that by no means is caught on yet, uh, but it's something that we're looking more and more into, that rather than saying, uh, saying it's a, a difference between developed versus developing countries, what we're seeing is it's the poor living among the wealthy in the G20 economies that are accounting for these diseases. So the G20 economies now account for most of now most of the world's worm infections, Leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, tuberculosis, dengue, uh, leprosy, and, and the list goes on. And on the next slide, and and along the same vein, you know, so far we're seeing COVID-19 mostly among the G20 nations now, accounting for over three million cases. But one of the things that we're seeing play out in a very blue marble health fashion is the fact that it's people living in poverty are often disproportionately affected. So here in Texas, in Houston, and also in New Orleans, it's people who live in poor neighborhoods and especially uh, African-American, Hispanic American, and now Native American uh, minority groups that are being disproportionately affected. We're now learning about the devastation among Navajo populations in the, in the Southwestern U.S. So it's a very much along that same lens of blue marble health. And now Johns Hopkins University Press is planning on issuing a, sort of an, a COVID ver instant book version of the blue marble health book that I hope will come out uh, in a couple of weeks. In the next slide. 
So uh, just a few words about COVID-19. It's, it's behaving in ways that I, I've not really seen from uh, coronaviruses. And, you know, we're, we're starting to hear stories now from the docs and, and working in the ICUs and the New York hospitals at, at Bellevue at NYU at Cornell and Brookdale and you know the list goes on how there seems a really interesting phenomenon very worrisome phenomenon and, and that it's not just a matter of pulmonary disease that we're seeing with this it's also severe heart disease sudden death uh, strokes uh, uh, coagulopathies as well as high rates of disease among people with obesity and I'm trying to understand if there's any unifying theme to this and there's this interesting graphic that we have found um, looking and there's the reference to it below where the ACE2 receptors are and one of the things we know about the, the SARS-2 coronavirus that causes this is it binds very tightly to ACE2 receptors and it occurred to me that a lot of these very odd clinical sequelae may indeed be a consequence of that type binding uh, to the ACE2 receptors, which are found in the tissues uh, I list above. And maybe that might turn out to be a unifying theme. No evidence for that yet, but I think it's something we're very interested in exploring. And the next slide. So there's now uh, an aggressive effort to uh, develop vaccines now for the SARS-2 vaccine. And most of them, uh, most of the vaccine approaches, you can understand from looking at that picture in the upper right there, which is, you know, we've all by now seen cartoons of coronaviruses that look like donuts with RNA filling up the middle of the donut. And then there are these spikes coming out of it. And that spikes are the S protein that binds with the host receptor. And it turns out most of the vaccines under development are involved in creating an immune response to the COVID-19 virus, to the SARS-2 virus, to prevent binding of the virus to host receptors. And then it's a matter of figuring out which technology might be the best in inducing that protective response against the spike protein. And on the, on the left-hand side is a slide from Tony Fauci, from Dr. Anthony Fauci, listing the major uh, techno platform technologies now involved in uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine development. And, um, and, but the basic idea is all of them are more or less working by inducing immunity to the spike protein or a component called the receptor binding domain. So that uh, recombinant protein, one listed there is ours that being developed at Baylor and Texas Children's. There's nanoparticle vaccines. We've heard a lot about the DNA and RNA vaccines and some of the companies involved with those virus vector vaccines and even live attenuated vaccines. On the next slide. So one of the things that we're doing to address all of these poverty related neglected diseases arising in places like Venezuela and the Arabian Peninsula and in Africa and elsewhere is trying to develop vaccines uh, for them, which includes the COVID-19 vaccine, but others as well. And I like to say that we try to develop the vaccines no one else is attempting because they're mostly for poverty related diseases. So about a decade ago, we moved to Baylor College of Medicine to set up this National School of Tropical Medicine together uh, with a vaccine center at Texas Children's Hospital. And that's a picture just of Texas Children's Hospital in the Texas Medical Center. And it's co-directed, so I'm the dean of the school, but for the vaccine center, I co-direct uh, that with this, the woman on the lower left there, that's Mary Elena Batazzi, and we've been science partners for more than uh, 20 years and really trying to pioneer this concept of how you can develop vaccines in the nonprofit sector. On the next slide. So uh, it's called the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development, CVD. And we got the idea of calling it CVD, uh, named after one of my uh, friends and heroes, uh, Mike Levine, who's been running the University of Maryland CV CVD forever and now being taken over under the able leadership of Kathy Newsel. And, and, and the approach is to develop low-cost global health vaccines 
mostly recombinant protein vaccines where we actually do the technology transfer to low and middle income countries. So we're building vaccine development capacity in parallel. And there's a, a, a portfolio of our major vaccines uh, that we have in various stages of product and clinical development for schistosomiasis and hookworm and river onchocerciasis is river blindness, leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, and then those uh, coronavirus infections, uh, which include uh, SARS and MERS and now SARS-2. Now the next slide. Uh, you might say, well, how does COVID-19 or how do coronaviruses fit in with neglected diseases? Well, what we're now starting to see is uh, COVID-19 is not only now a problem of Europe and the US, it's now starting to race into other parts of the world. We're hearing terrible stories in Ecuador now in Guayaquil about how bodies are being piling up in the streets and especially in the crowded urban slums of Latin American cities, we're hearing now about a big sharp increase in Fortaleza and Belém in Manaus and Northern Brazil, even in Rio. And I think this is gonna be the one of the next big waves now that the virus is gonna start moving into the Southern hemisphere. We're hearing about big upticks in, in Mumbai and in India and in other Indian cities. I'm worried about Lagos, I'm worried about Dhaka and Bangladesh. And, and you know we're now taking our low cost global health approach for vaccines and hopefully going to have a role on global health vaccines for COVID-19. And the next slide. So we just announced yesterday uh, our partnership for a global coronavirus vaccine initiative. And on the bottom are some of the institutions we've been working with for a long time, Walter Reed and uh, UTMB and Galveston and New York Blood Center supported by NIH. And now we've announced our new partnership with PATH, which is uh, a renowned product development partnership based in Seattle uh, that led the uh, development and licensure of the meningococcal A vaccine for Africa and the malaria vaccine. And now we're partnering with them for our global coronavirus vaccine. Next slide. And just a word about our lead candidate, it's actually repurposing the original SARS-CoV receptor binding domain uh, where we've now accumulated evidence uh, that it uh, cross binds and cross neutralizes uh, pseudoviruses expressing the SARS-2 uh, uh, receptor binding domain. What's exciting about it is there are a bunch of numbers there looking at yield and purity. And what that really translates is this is a vaccine that we could produce in large amounts and incredibly low cost. So it's, this, it's a yeast derived recombinant protein vaccine that uses the same technology that was used to develop the um, uh, recombinant hepatitis vaccine that's now used all over the world that's made in India and Brazil. And so we like the fact that it uses that similar kind of technology on the next slide. And these are our uh, survival curves showing that we're getting 100% protection 100% survival in mice that are vaccinated compared to the control mice that are dying. These are either transgenic mice uh, uh, for the ACE2 receptor. Uh, and these are studies done by our collaborator, Ken Chang at the Galveston National Lab or using mouse adapted virus on the next slide. And then one of the reasons we've selected uh, this particular vaccine uh, and, and the adjuvant is because it seems to avoid a lot of the immunopathology you've been hearing about with some experimental uh, coronavirus vaccines. And there's two problems that have been seen, one in animals and the other in vitro. The one in animals is called eosinophilic immune enhancement, which uh, seems to occur via Th17 mechanisms with IL-6. And that's why you see reduced eosinophilic immune enhancement when you use alum in your adjuvants. It's something that you see as, that's especially problematic among virus vectored vaccines. And that's one of the reasons we go with alum is it seems to reduce eosinophilic immune enhancement. Some people are surprised to hear that because they think because you have eosinophils there that it must be done through a Th2 mechanism. But what we and others are finding is it's very much linked to a, a Th17 
the same kind of reason that you see eosinophils in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And then another in vitro phenomenon that's been seen is antibody dependent enhancement uh, develop, and some people are finding it due to neutralizing antibodies, other non-neutralizing antibodies. And we think we've been able to minimize that by getting rid of the antibody dependent enhancing epitopes by, out of the S protein by focusing on, on the RBD. And on the next slide is some of our immune enhancement data. The worst one is done using some of the whole virus, but also the, spike, the full spike protein on the lower right. So this is immunohistochemistry looking for eosinophils. And you can see that with our RBD, we, especially on the upper left, we can greatly minimize that. So we're pretty excited about it given our preclinical data showing protection and minimizing eosinophilic immune enhancement. On the next slide, and this is our, our, our partnership. And, and, and just in case you're interested, uh, we are still raising money for this. It's uh, tragic that we're still having to raise money for our COVID-19 vaccines, even in these terrible times, but we're, uh, we're getting there. We're, we think we're almost at the amount, we, we're just about there, the amount we need for the phase four to start moving this into clinical, a full clinical development plan. And those are our links to our two sites, either through Texas Children's, texaschildrensvaccines.org, or we have a Just Giving campaign for the vaccine out of Baylor. Uh, next slide. And now we're really trying to look at this concept of, okay, we're going to get through the early stages of vaccine development for all of our vaccines. How are we going to scale them up? And and we're and we're very much taken with this idea that I really tried to push hard on when I was US science envoy of vaccine diplomacy. And that is nations putting aside their ideologies to work together in order to make uh, life-saving vaccines. And the idea was inspired when I was uh, president of the Sabin Vaccine Institute. And I first heard from Heloisa Sabin, Albert Sabin's widow about Albert's efforts to work with Soviet scientists at the height of the Cold War to uh, develop vaccines and how both Soviet scientists and the US scientists put aside their ideologies to work together on, on life-saving uh, vaccines. And, and, we, and that's what I've been trying to do in the Middle East and elsewhere and with other uh, Muslim majority countries. Uh, and that's gonna be, I think, an important theme if we're really serious about developing global vaccines for diseases like COVID on the next slide. Now, one of the other big forces that's gonna be working against us beyond war, political collapse, and climate change if, and urbanization, if that weren't bad enough, we have this problem of anti-science. And unfortunately, the anti-science movements are very strong in the United States. And we're already seeing this now play out against uh, social distancing. And you're seeing, unfortunately, in my state and others, big demonstrations and uh, you know uh, trying to go after prominent scientists, including Dr. Fauci, but they've also been going after me and others. And we're seeing, and, and the, the way these protests are playing out, I, I'm finding it very ominous. Uh, we're already seeing in, in Michigan, these anti-science movements against vaccines, uh, including uh, COVID-19 vaccines, has been accompanied by individuals parading around wearing camouflage and holding rifles in a very menacing uh, type of way. And this is uh, a culmination, I think, of, of something that we've been following for a number of years on the next slide. Um, this uh, problem of this anti-science movement, which is sometimes known as the anti-vax or the anti-vaccine movement with the World Health Organization first identified a year ago as one of the top 10 global health threats, calling it vaccine hesitancy. And it began really in response to declines in measles vaccination coverage, because it was alleged that the MMR vaccine causes autism. And we started to see this uh, gain ascendancy uh, with measles in 2018, with more than 80,000 measles cases in Europe, then it expanded to 100,000 measles cases in 2019. 
and it was really built on 20 years of uh, declines in vaccination coverage for measles that began on the next slide with this fake uh, paper in The Lancet uh, written by Andrew Wakefield and his colleagues claiming that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine uh, has the ability to cause what was then called pervasive developmental disorder, now we call it uh, autism. Uh, it was ultimately retracted by The Lancet, but it took 12 years to get retracted and that gave a lot of momentum to the anti-vaccine movement that's now been taking off in the US and, and next slide. It's um, particularly bad in Texas where we've seen now uh, more than 60,000 kids denied access to their vaccines. Uh, and it's been particularly bad in the Austin area for reasons that we can talk about, uh, but, um, and we don't even know about the homeschooled kids. Uh, and what's happened in Texas, which is pretty odd, is it's become very politicized since 2015. It's linked itself to the far right wing of the Republican party, the Tea Party. And, and a lot of that is involved in language, libertarian language saying, you can't tell us what to do with our kids, um, uh, that uh, there's this concept they, they promote called medical freedom or health freedom. And now it's been tied to the protests around uh, social distancing. Uh, so this is gonna be a, a more and more worrisome trend that we're gonna have to follow on the next slide. Uh, and uh, based on what we saw happening in Texas, I worked with a medical student, Jackie Olive. You know where we weren't funded to do this uh, together with two of our faculty. We started seeing if these sharp declines in vaccine coverage are unique to Texas. And we identified a number of hotspot areas where we might predict that uh, vaccine hesitancy could lead to measles epidemics. And sure enough, we have seen measles epidemics last year and about half of them. And we are starting to see the return of measles to the United States. So as bad as things are, with COVID-19, it may not stay restricted to COVID-19. Now we have to contend with measles as well as declines in influenza vaccine coverage on the next slide. So uh, I'm quite worried about this four-headed anti-vax monster. Um, a lot of the anti-vaccine activities are been reorganized now under RFK Jr., Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who started this organization which has the unfortunate name of Children's Health Defense in 2018. And they've been very active and very aggressive, including a lot of aggression towards me personally, you know, putting out a lot of fake information about vaccine scientists, and, including me. Uh, it turns out they think I'm making millions of dollars for our schistosomiasis vaccine, which my wife aunt says, if, if only that were the case, but unfortunately no dollars so far and, and, and no hope that we will. Um, and so here are the four components that I'm seeing of the anti-vaccine movement. I'm seeing a prominent media component now of 480 fake anti-vaccine misinformation websites out there, including, you know, Amazon. I mean, you can go to the Amazon website now and you can do this right now in your computer. You put books up at the top and then you'll get a scroll down menu at the left that's, that has uh, health, wellness and dieting. You click on that, you get vaccinations. You click on that, you'll get all fake anti-vaccine books. So Amazon is now the single largest promoter of fake anti-vaccine books. Uh, and then there's this political machine where they've created political action group. Political action groups like Texans for Vaccine Choice have started in most states now. Not all, many are linked to sort of the far right wing of the Republican party and get money from donors that typically give to Tea Party uh, causes and issues. And then there's sort of this, what I call deliberate predation, uh, focusing on specific groups. Originally it was the uh, Somali immigrant community in 2017 that led to um, a terrible measles epidemic. Then the Orthodox Jewish community last year, and now you're starting to see, uh, and with very you know inflammatory images and language like these fake yellow Jewish stars, which are extremely offensive. Uh, and then uh, we're also now seeing this moving to the African-American community, where again, uh, they're, they're calling vaccines the next Tuskegee experiment, 
really inflammatory stuff. And then the last one, the war on women, they're targeting the HPV vaccine specifically, saying it causes teenage suicide and depression. And this is leading to big declines in HPV vaccine coverage, uh, really denying a generation of cancer prevention to, to women across the country. So, you know, unnecessary cases of cervical cancer, as opposed to Australia, which has announced they're going to eliminate cervical cancer by the year 2030. On the next slide. So this is one of the reasons I got involved with fighting the anti-vaccine movement because I'm a vaccine scientist and pediatrician, but I also have a daughter with autism and wrote this book called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, which goes into the science explaining how why there's no link between vaccines and autism, and why there's no plausibility for it, because we've learned so much through the science funded by NIH about how uh, autism begins in early fetal brain development through the action of more than 100 genes. And, uh, and now we've done whole exome sequencing on Rachel at Baylor Genetics and been able to identify a, a new autism gene that bears some resemblance to the neuronal cytoskeleton genes are already published. On the next slide. And uh, again, I, I blame a lot of the anti-vaccine movements uh, to the fact that historically scientists have been so invisible up until recently. And I don't have a lot of evidence to support that, but I go back to this slide that Research America uh, published a couple of years back, and it'd be great if they were to update it, because I think things will be better now with all the people tuning into COVID-19 information on the cable news networks. But you know, back uh, a couple of years ago, they found that the vast majority of Americans cannot name a living scientist. Even if they could, it was, you know, individuals like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye, great, great people, but, you know, not, you know, working scientists that we, as we know them that are struggling over grant applications and lab meetings and uh, doing major revisions on papers. And on the right, there is a study showing the vast majority of Americans uh, uh, scientists are not, you know, out there on social media blogging about their science. So there is that invisibility factor that I think has been very enabling. On the next slide. So I'll end there to say that, you know, the way I see this working out in terms of the future of disease and global health is going to be a bit of an epic struggle. It's, you know, on the one hand, we're seeing great progress through vaccines and new biologicals, including potentially new COVID vaccines, mass treatment, vector control strategies, but then we're still going to have to contend with these very dominant 21st century forces, including poverty, uh, climate change, war and political collapse, and, and urbanization. And we'll see, you know, which of these is going to win out. I hope it's the ones on the left, but uh, happy to you know, stop there and see if we have time for a few questions, Jenny. And thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Peter. We do indeed have time for questions. I mean, thank you. What a tremendously content-rich, uh, important, and sobering uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, getting into this this topic of visibility of scientists and how do we encourage that? And what have you learned? You know, you are one of those scientists who has tens of thousands of people on your your uh, you know your Twitter feed, and um, you make a lot of public appearances in mainstream media. What have you learned as sort of key uh, key tips for scientists who want to be able to communicate clearly to the American public? Well, thanks for that, and it's something I've tried. To, and sometimes I don't really quite know what I do but it seems to be working. Um, a couple of things along those lines. The best, the nicest compliment, the one that resonated with me was given by one of my editors at Johns Hopkins Press. He said, Peter, you have this knack for being able to complain, to explain, I have knack to complain as well, but I have knack to explain complex scientific concepts without dumbing it down, without seeming condescending, without making people feel like you're talking down to them. And, and I think that's the key, right? To, you need time to be able to explain complex scientific concepts. And I think what's out there, there's a lot of people who specialize in communications who think you have to dumb it down, who think you, know, you have to really simplify it. And I push back on that. I say, no, I think 
the American people are smart enough to understand complex concepts, but you have to give it a little time. You have to not use a lot of jargon. And if you're willing to do that, people get it and people like it and people understand it better. So one of the things that I try to do, you know, when I'm on, you know, whatever it is, Fox News or MSNBC or, or CNN is, that's not easy going from Fox News to CNN or NBC is to, is to explain why I came up with the, the things that I say. And I think that's been the weakness of some of the, the White House uh, coronavirus task force briefings is that they'll throw numbers out there without taking the time to explain how they derived the numbers, where they came from, which is something that, that I'll do and that's often uh, quite appreciated. And, and the hard part is getting the interview time to do it because uh, you know, sometimes you only get a two minute hit or a three minute hit. And um, now I've got, you know, the networks are willing to give me a little more time. And, that, and I need that time to explain what I'm thinking. And the other thing I do is I try to personalize it. I, you know, I, I give it and I say it's a very, you know, personal perspective and, and I'll interweave it with stories about either my family or people I know and or my past training, and some people are annoyed by it, but others like it because it, because people need to be able to identify with scientists. People need to be able to have a face that goes along with it. And I think that also seems to resonate. It also resonates with people in the UK, which is kind of interesting. Terrific. Well, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Terry. Um, I think we have some questions uh, in our question box. That's correct. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hotez. One question coming in, um, with all the various and disparate vaccine development efforts going on across the globe, um, how can we ensure efficient collaboration within the research community, um, specifically related especially to patient recruitment for clinical trials? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of problems with the communication strategy, and I've pointed this out to um, the scientific leaders in this country, including NIH, and they totally get it. So we're so that's a work in progress. So we need to uh, have a little more robust communication around vaccines because, you know, there's a lot of language coming out there that confuses people, especially when they say they're going to have uh, a vaccine by the fall. They're not going to have a vaccine by the fall. There's no way you're going to collect enough efficacy data and safety data to to have that. And I think part of the problem is uh, we're I think the White House is very focused on the manufacturing strategy and, and how we're going to scale up manufacturing and basically taking lessons learned from making ventilators and making diagnostic kits and applying that to vaccines. And now we're really stressing the importance of understanding what it means to go through a phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trial and why it takes time to collect all that e efficacy and safety data. And I think that's what you're going to see come out next. Regarding international cooperation, yeah, that that has been challenging. You know, I, you know, I also think there's been misunderstanding there because there was a big announcement uh, earlier this week about CEPI and WHO and this big global initiative that the United States is not part of, and people just assume that must be something coming out of the Trump administration. I say, well, not entirely because. You know, one of the reasons why the U.S. is not necessarily linked up with, with CEPI and others in the past is because the U.S. is already the largest funder of global health technologies. I mean, if you ever look at the, um, the G-Finder report, which is this great this is organization called Policy Cures out of Australia, where they track the public spending on global health technologies, many people are surprised to learn overwhelmingly the U.S. is by far the largest funder of global health technologies. And a lot of, almost all of that's from NIH and almost all of that is from NIAID uh, at, to the tune of about a billion dollars a year. And then much further down is the UK uh, and, and the European Union. And the big problem is we're not getting the other G20 countries to step up, but the US overwhelmingly through NIH is the largest funder of global health technology, You know, far more for instance than even the Gates uh, Foundation. Uh, I think it's important for people to realize that how, what what our footprint is in, in global health already. Terry, I believe we have some additional questions. We sure do. Uh, here's a question uh, from a Sabin vaccine, uh, vaccine Institute alum who says, hi, Peter, from Emily Conran. 
Uh, Hi, Emily. Which is now working on global health R&D advocacy, uh, recognizing the long timeline of vaccine development and the fact that the first set vaccine, like you said, is unlikely to be the best. How can we encourage Congress to make bold but patient and long-term investments in vaccine research and development, both for COVID-19 and future threats? Well, um, hopefully um, the urgency that everyone is seeing around COVID-19 will translate into bigger investments for global health vaccines. On the other hand, I said that after SARS in 2003, and then I said it again after H1N1 in 2009, I said it again after MERS in 2012, I said it after Ebola in 2014, and I said it again after Zika in 2016. But I think this one uh, will, clear, will clearly resonate with, with Congress and that the, it's extremely complicated to accelerate a new vaccine in the middle of a, of a pandemic caused by a new pathogen. It's not something we have a lot of experience with. We, did, we were somewhat successful with Ebola, which by the way, was an amazing success story. So that would be another way, Emily, is to you know, really catalog our successes. I mean, that Ebola story is, I think one of the most important global health stories never told. How you know, NIH funded research and the uh, Bar work of BARDA and Public Health Canada as well, which was involved in a lot of the R&D. Uh, and then Merck and Company coming together with uh, the WHO and Gavi and UNICEF and the MSF and the Wellcome Trust. And think of what was done. That vaccine uh, was accelerated uh, in the VSV vaccine accelerated in clinical trials of over 200,000 people under some of the most horrendous circumstances imaginable, war and political collapse in the DR Congo, uh, in the death of some vaccinators uh, and healthcare workers, ultimately shown to be over 90% protective and safe. And that basically prevented a Ebola epidemic that it would have easily dwarfed the one in 2014 in West Africa, would have destabilized the African continent. I think it's one of the great, greatest public health stories that's not yet been told. And, and we've got to continue to tell stories like that or what's going on now with, with COVID-19. And I, and I think we will see a sea change in that. Thank you, Peter. Another question, which kind of builds on that uh, from our own Mary Woolley, if you could speak a little more about the implications of people hearing so much more about science in real time from scientists, how can we use all this attention to science to help stand down what you told us about the anti-vax monster? Yeah, I, I think now is the time that we need to uh, re really recognize that it's a problem. I think in you know, we, we have some great vaccine organizations, uh, advocacy organizations out there like, like Sabin, like um, uh, Vaccinate Your Family, uh, like the Immunization Partnership. Now I've done it. You, when you go down a rabbit hole, start naming names, then you forget to name the other names. So please forgive me. But, you know, we have got a good base of organizations advocating for vaccines. But now I think is the time to really get the scientists out there, um, and now we've already seen how much of a difference it can make when, when you actually hear from actual scientists on the cable networks and the, and the network news. How should we leverage that? Well, I think a few things. One, uh, you're, I think you're going to see this next generation of young scientists really excited by this and really want opportunities to do the public engagement. Um, I would love to see, for instance, Mary, a, a Research America initiative that builds in public engagement, science training uh, for PhDs and postdoctoral fellows or even medical students. Uh, if you build it, they'll come. If you were to create content on how to do public engagement uh, and uh, the, the, they'll get interested. I know this because whenever I, you know, before COVID-19 giving Grand Rounds lectures or speaking to groups of PhD students, you know, they'll come up to me, hey, doc, Dr. Hotez, I'm all in, how do we do it? And the problem is we don't have the infrastructure in place. The other thing we have to fix is the ecosystem for it because, you know, when I was getting my training and my MD and PhD, the message was, no, you don't engage the public. That's seen as a form of grandstanding or, uh, uh, or um, 
uh, self-promotion. And we got to get beyond that because I think what happened was nobody said anything. And the consequence was it was just a handful of organizations like Research America and, and some of the others that I've named and not hearing from the scientists themselves, you know, other than what Research America and others were putting on, what, you know, had a detrimental effect. And now we've got to fix that. And what that means is academic department chairs and deans, now that I'm a dean, I've gone over to the dark side, have to figure out a way to encourage uh, uh, promoting science in the public domain as an important activity. Because I think a lot of academic health center office of communications don't really, you know, maybe changing now, but traditionally haven't liked their docs and scientists out there. They want to control the message. They, um, uh, they're worried about the reputation to the institution that if we mess up, we say something incorrect that incorrectly that will have damage to the institutions. I think we've got to slowly change that culture to get department chairs, deans, and university presidents actively encouraging our scientists to be out there. And maybe this will be the event that makes it happen. Well, what a great uh, topic to end on. I mean, we are with you all the way on the public engagement of scientists. And I'll send you some information about a micro grant program that we've been running for two years with uh, support from the Rita Allen Foundation, helping early career scientists get more involved, particularly locally. Uh, but I think we have run our course. Um, I hope, again, Peter, thank you. What an incredible hour to spend with you. Um, and I hope you can all join us for our next Alliance member call, which is on Monday with the Honorable Dr. Lewis Sullivan, former HHS secretary. Um, he will be talking about health disparities during the COVID-19 crises, among other topics. Um, so keep an eye out for invite emails and the registration links. We welcome your suggestions for future speakers. And thank you again. Please stay in touch with us.